Hi, it's Katrina. Ornamental Baboon Tarantula The ornamental baboon tarantula is native to West Africa and mainly found in the areas of Togo and Ghana. Once these spiders are fully grown, which tends to take about three years, they can reach a leg span of about five inches. These spiders are characterized by their chalky white coloration with mottled black and brown markings. These tarantulas have very thick rear legs and like to hide in trees where they can be camouflaged. These spiders can be aggressive and have very strong venom. In fact, they are believed to have one of the most potent venom of all tarantulas. They do not have urticating hairs like other tarantulas, so their bite is their only form of defense. While their venom is probably not enough to kill anyone, I don't recommend you handling it. Yellow Sack Spider Yellow sack spiders come in many species and are common throughout the US, Mexico, and South America. A few species can also be found almost everywhere in the world. They're pretty small, measuring between 3 to 15 millimeters long, and are known to frequently make their way into people's homes. They are a defensive spider that lives in gardens in the summer and goes indoors when it gets cold, so you might be surprised one day when you least expect it. The bite is said to feel like a wasp sting. Best case scenario, the spider's venom causes a small red welt, which is unpleasant but tolerable. If the wound is more serious or becomes infected, symptoms like nausea, headache, dizziness, and fever may set in. Even in more severe cases like this, there's no reason to panic, because in most instances, the discomfort eventually subsides with no long-term damage. The yellow sack spider's venom contains cytotoxin, which means necrosis or rotting of the skin tissue can occur. In the most extreme cases, bites can lead to anaphylactic shock. Yellow sack spider bites are often diagnosed as brown recluse spider bites, but the latter's venom is much more potent and dangerous. On the other hand, many people experience few or no symptoms beyond mild discomfort. An encounter with one of these spiders is more likely during early summer, when they have an increased presence due to mating season. It's common for people to accidentally bother one while gardening or playing outside, and taking common sense measures like inspecting shoes and clothing for unwanted visitors can prevent a bite. Black Widow Spider The Black Widow genus of spiders consists of several species who carry a trademark hourglass-shaped mark on their backs and are notorious for their neurotoxin-infused venom. They dwell in temperate regions throughout the world, and apparently they like the same places where grapes usually grow. Black Widow venom is reportedly 15 times more potent than that of a rattlesnake. It overloads neurons and affects the connections between nerve cells, resulting in a condition called latrodectism. Bites are accompanied by excruciating side effects, including nausea, muscle aches, sweating, vomiting, and difficulty breathing caused by paralysis of the diaphragm. Despite their deadly reputation, black widow bites rarely cause severe harm, let alone death. Those greatest at risk for severe symptoms or worse are children, the elderly, and people with weak immune systems. Fatalities can also occur due to cardiovascular complications resulting from hypertension. Black widows are non-aggressive and typically only bite out of self-defense. Many bites result from accidental contact, such as unknowingly sitting on one or cleaning dusty corners in your house. Brazilian Wandering Spider Also called arm spiders or banana spiders, Brazilian wandering spiders come in eight different species, all of which are found in Brazil, while some also occur in other parts of Latin America. They reach up to two inches long with a leg span of up to six inches and are hairy and mostly brown. These nocturnal hunters spend their days hiding in crevices and under logs. Their menu consists of other spiders, insects, and even small amphibians, mice, and reptiles. Brazilian wandering spiders appear aggressive because of their defensive posture, which involves raising their first two pairs of legs, making themselves look bigger. But this behavior is more of a warning than a threat. It means the spider feels intimidated and is giving you one last chance to make yourself scarce before it resorts to plan B and bites you. The creature's potent venom attacks the victim's neuromuscular system, causing initial symptoms such as sweating, goosebumps, and burning pain. Within a half hour, side effects can escalate to high or low blood pressure, an elevated or decreased heart rate, nausea, hypothermia, blurred vision, vertigo, convulsions, and even shock. Bites are rare, and bite victims typically survive, as the spider only injects venom in about one-third of bites. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. Men need to watch out because the bite can deliver a long and painful erection, but because of this, several studies have looked at using this venom for erectile dysfunction drugs. As of 2008, there were only 10 recorded deaths in Brazil from the Brazilian wandering spider's bite. Just the same, experts encourage people to seek immediate medical treatment if they suspect they've been bitten by one. After all, 
Better safe than sorry. Over the last few years, Brazilian wandering spiders have made their way to other parts of the world in shipments of bananas. So, although you might not expect to ever come across a Brazilian wandering spider in your lifetime, that doesn't mean that they can't make their way to your local grocery store. Brown Widow Spider The brown widow spider was first described based on a specimen discovered in South America, but the species is thought to have evolved in Africa. It exists in other parts of the world, such as Southern California, Hawaii, Florida, the Caribbean, Japan, Cyprus, and Australia as an invasive species. This tropical and subtropical species only seems to be spreading, with a more noticeable presence in U.S. Gulf states in recent years. While the brown widow's venom is estimated to be up to twice as strong as the black widow's venom, brown widows typically only inject a minimal amount of venom when they bite. This is an example of how venom toxicity is just one factor that determines a spider's deadliness. In many cases, a brown widow bite hurts and leaves a mark, much like a common household spider. Severe symptoms are possible, and there is at least one documented case of a patient requiring hospitalization. But unless side effects extend beyond mildly inconvenient redness and discomfort, experts recommend washing and icing the wound and applying an anti-itch cream. It should go away on its own, but any signs of infection such as swelling, pus, or warmth to the touch indicate that it's time to seek professional care. Redback Spider Redback spiders are native to Australia and are closely related to black widows. They're extremely versatile and can survive anywhere outside their indigenous habitat, so long as their basic needs such as warmth, adequate food, and a sheltered place for a web are available. This species has an especially noticeable presence in urban and populated areas. Bites are somewhat common, especially during the summer. While it's in the redback spider's custom to play dead when threatened rather than respond aggressively, one will resort to such measures when necessary, especially a female defending her eggs. Redback spiders also often bite when a human unintentionally comes into contact with one, which often happens when they're getting dressed or putting their shoes on. Around 250 bite cases are treated in Australia annually. While many require medical attention, a handful of others presumably go unreported. In fact, only an estimated 10 to 20 percent of bites are envenomated. While the redback spider's venom can cause serious injury and in extreme cases death, the severity of symptoms depends on the amount of venom injected, which the spider has direct control over. Bite symptoms include pain, obviously, which is often worsening or severe, sweating, especially at the site, vomiting, nausea, swollen lymph nodes, and muscular weakness. As torturous as these side effects sound, on the bright side, no deaths have occurred since the introduction of the anti-venom. At the same time, the anti-venom's effectiveness is a topic of contentious debate among researchers, so it's hard to say. Just best that to get bitten. Brown Recluse Spider Infamous for its venomous and painful bite, the brown recluse spider is common throughout the South and Central United States. Unlike most spiders who have eight eyes, the brown recluse has six uniquely shaped eyes. The uniformly colored velvety species measures just three-eighths of an inch on average. It gets its name from its elusive and nocturnal nature, which entails avoiding humans as much as possible. The brown recluse, like many other spiders, usually only bites in response to a perceived threat, and it's entirely possible to trigger one without meaning to. Bites are highly venomous and should be treated with emergency medical care, according to the National Institute of Health. There is no anti-venom, but most bites will heal just fine without medical attention or scarring. Symptoms vary depending on the amount of venom injected and the victim's sensitivity to it and may include chills, nausea, fever, itching, sweating, and general discomfort. Not great. Reactions can be immediate, delayed, or for a lucky few, completely absent. Less fortunate individuals may experience blistering, lesions, and even volcano lesions, which are open wounds that have become gangrenous and which grow as large as a human hand. The ideal response to a bite is to wash it and get to the ER just in case your side effects fall into the unfavorable end of the spectrum. Chilean Recluse Spider The Chilean recluse spider is native to South America, dwelling primarily in Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. This species is also sometimes seen in Mexico and the U.S. It's perhaps the most dangerous spider within its genus, despite measuring a mere 8 to 30 millimeters. It's also called the corner spider since it tends to hide in difficult-to-access spaces, like within cracks and behind or underneath furniture. It's said that up to half of all Chilean households host at least one of these pesky and potentially harmful intruders. 
The Chilean recluse spider is active year-round, but tends to come out more during hotter weather, often prompting experts to warn the public to be cautious. In late 2018, the spider made headlines for seriously injuring a 16-year-old Chilean girl who ended up in the hospital. People are most likely to fall victim by unintentionally encountering a Chilean recluse spider, for example by reaching into a dark closet where one has taken up headquarters. The skin blisters and swells immediately following a bite. Over the following hours, the victim can expect their pain to worsen, for the bite to become itchy and for a dark spot to form on the site. While only an estimated 3% of cases are fatal, experts warn people to err on the safe side by checking for spiders before sticking their hand or foot into a dark space. But if worse comes to worse and a Chilean recluse bites, it's recommended to clean the wound, apply ice, and get to an emergency room. Six-Eyed Sand Spider The medium-sized six-eyed sand spider dwells in deserts and sandy environments throughout southern Africa. It measures between 1 and 2 inches long and has a leg span of around 4 inches. This species is related to recluse spiders, which are distributed worldwide, and several African and South American species. Its flattened stance and lateral moving legs have also earned it the nickname of the six-eyed crab spider. This creature is covered in small hairs called setae, which help to camouflage it by holding particles of sand. The six-eyed sand spider is possibly the world's most venomous spider. According to toxicology studies, it contains a hemolytic component which ruptures red blood cells and causes a necrotic effect, meaning it destroys tissue. There is no anti-venom, meaning this spider's bite is more likely to be lethal than many other species, but nobody knows for sure because there are no confirmed records of human bites. There are two suspected cases, one which resulted in the amputation of a man's arm due to severe necrosis, and another where the victim bled to death. The good news is that the six-eyed sand spider is pretty shy and rarely comes into contact with humans. When it does, it doesn't always bite. And when it bites, it doesn't always release a large amount of venom, or any at all. Australian Funnel Web Spiders The Australian Funnel Web family of spiders consists of 40 known species and is named after their peculiar tube-shaped webs. While some species are presumed to be harmless, others possess potent and fast-acting venom and rank among the world's most dangerous spiders. Perhaps the deadliest family member is the Sydney funnel web spider, which lives in various bushland and suburban environments along Australia's east coast. It looks terrifying, with its rear-facing fangs that are sharp enough to cut through fingernails and a relatively large body size. This nocturnal creature hides out during the day, which is why it's somewhat common for people to find one camping in their shoe or in a dark corner of their home. In fact, its proximity to humans is one of the major reasons it's considered so dangerous. The Sydney funnel web spider is both highly venomous and aggressive. It's likely the culprit behind all serious funnel web spider bites and the 13 recorded deaths that resulted from the bites between 1927 and 1980. The spider's venom contains an ultratoxin protein, which severely affects the nervous system and can kill a human within 15 minutes. Bite symptoms include rapid heart rate, difficulty breathing, and numbness around the mouth. While the funnel web spider did not evolve specifically to attack humans, its venom is particularly effective on primates and invertebrates, something Dr. Robert Raven, curator of arachnids at Queensland Museum, calls an evolutionary accident. The good news is that household pets recover from bites quickly and safely, and luckily for humans, an anti-venom was introduced in 1981, and there have been no known fatalities since. Mercy Side Jaws in December 2010, 36-year-old Simon Hoban noticed what looked like a gigantic shark when he looked at Albert Dock in Merseyside, England using Google Earth. Albert Dock is a major tourist attraction in the city and is often used for community events, so a huge shark in the water is kind of a scary thought. Good news is that the water was practically freezing, after all, it is December in the UK, so it's not like anyone would be in the water. If the massive animal was, in fact, a shark, it posed little harm to humans. So was this creature really a shark? It may have actually been a basking shark, which grow up to 39 feet long, according to marine biology expert Tom Cornwell. In an interview with the Daily Mail, he explained water creatures have been known to cruise the wrong way up rivers and canals and become stranded, adding perhaps it was an old shark which was looking for a place to die. That's kind of a sad thought. While you might not think Britain is famous for sharks, there are 21 native species of shark year-round and over 40 species that pass through UK waters. There are also dolphins, porpoises, and whales. So if you would like to see some amazing aquatic creatures, it might be the place to be, unless you are afraid of what might be in the water. Phantom Island 
In 2012, a team of Australian researchers noticed an island the size of Manhattan northwest of New Caledonia. It was called Sandy Island and they saw it on Google Earth. So the team sailed to the coordinates and what did they find? Nothing. Just open water as far as the eye could see. Yet for over a century, the phantom landmass had appeared on some maps. The whaling ship Velocity first recorded Sandy Island in 1876, and in 1908 it was first incorporated into a British Admiralty chart. After that, expeditions failed to spot it and didn't seem to be reporting it anymore. Starting in the 70s, some official hydrographic charts removed Sandy Island completely. But what happened to it? Did the island ever really exist? It persisted into modern times on some map systems, including digital databases like the U.S. military's World Vector Shoreline Database and Google Earth, apparently. The crew recorded information at the site of the undiscovery that they planned to forward to the authorities so that Sandy Island could be removed from the map. Maria Seaton, who was chief scientist on the voyage who noticed Sandy Island's absence, explained that the Velocity's crew may have seen a giant pumice raft and mistaken it for land. The area between Fiji and New Caledonia is a pumice superhighway, which sees lots of the floating, lightweight rocks that underwater volcanic eruptions create. Seaton's team believes the wind and ocean currents cause pumice to combine and form these large rafts. So Sandy Island may have been a phantom island after all. Ancient Settlements A few years ago, an archaeology student made the discovery of a lifetime, thanks to Google Earth. He discovered a series of so-called lost Amazonian settlements in Brazil, dating back to 1500 AD. Jonas de Sousa of the University of Exeter was doing research and exploring the area using Google Earth and reported his findings in a study. He used satellite technology to detect the imprints of the former villages, which aren't easily visible with the naked eye. Then he, along with his team, used laser pulses to look past the dense vegetation and see what's shrouded underneath it. Archaeology has come a long way since the days of trudging through mosquito-infested swamps and dense vegetation trying to find stuff. The recently discovered settlements may have housed over 50 million people, around 1 million of which lived along the Tapajos River. Researchers believe Europeans wiped the ancient tribes out with killings and disease. Most of the Amazon is still unexplored archaeologically, de Sousa told New Scientist. The more we survey, the more we realize that different parts of the basin were more settled than we thought. With advanced technologies like LIDAR, scientists expect to continue making amazing new discoveries throughout the Amazon. Besides finding old settlements, it's believed that researchers will come across various remote villages belonging to some of the world's last uncontacted tribes, who live much like their ancestors did centuries ago. Plain Graveyard Nicknamed the Boneyard, the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona is a resting place for old and disused military aircraft. The 2,600-acre Steel Cemetery provides 90-minute bus tours, but people can also catch a glimpse of it courtesy of Google Earth. It's the world's largest aircraft boneyard. Those who are curious enough to check it out will encounter high-resolution imagery of nearly every plane the military has used since World War II. The 2,550-foot altitude, low humidity, and light annual rainfall make the property an ideal place for storing the planes, which remain relatively well-preserved. The defunct aircrafts are eventually scrapped or cannibalized, which is when a good part is taken from one aircraft for use on another, instead of repairing the broken part. Many of these planes also have the potential for reuse. There are typically over 4,400 aircrafts at AMARG. Upon arriving at the receiving branch, employees dismantle a plane's guns, classified hardware, and ejection seat charges. Then they wash the aircraft, drain the fuel, and refill the tank with oil, which they once again drain, leaving a protective coating inside the tank. Using an opaque plastic compound called Spraylat, workers then seal the aircraft from potential damage caused by high temperatures, sun, and dust. Finally, they tow the plane to its assigned storage space. AMARG houses aircrafts for different purposes, including parts reclamation, those awaiting transfer or sale, and long-term storage, where planes are maintained for purposes of future use. Last but not least, there are gutted-out planes that no longer contain usable parts, and which are slated to be scrapped, melted down, and recycled. Strange Gobi Desert Structures Google Earth images depicting strange patterns and structures in China's Gobi Desert surfaced in 2011. They appeared as white zigzagging lines that seemed to be painted onto the terrain. What the heck was it? 
experts bypassed the typical conspiracy theories regarding alien activity and instead suggested that the formations represented the country's spy and radar satellites. The strange white lines are possibly used for calibrating satellites, according to Jonathan Hill, a research technician at the Mars Space Flight Facility at Arizona State University. The one kilometer wide and two kilometer long grid may help satellite cameras orient themselves in space by focusing on the pattern. Former CIA analyst Alan Thompson revealed that since 2004, someone has ordered dozens of satellite pictures of the site. He discovered this via Google Earth's digital globe layer, which shows numerous requests for the satellite to position itself above the bizarre lines. As strange as this is, it's unlikely that a military or government agency is ordering the snapshots. They have their own, much more accurate satellites. But it's pretty weird. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Map Vertising As technology advances, companies are coming up with more clever ways to advertise than ever before. In a concept known as map vertising, companies create large advertisements that are best seen from the sky, hoping to catch the attention of Google Earth users. In fact, it's even possible to tour these massive billboards on Google Sightseeing. Included among the increasingly famous examples of this genius marketing strategy is the world's largest Coca-Cola logo, made from actual Coca-Cola bottles on a Chilean hillside. Another example is an 87,500-square-foot rendering of KFC's Colonel Sanders, visible from above the extraterrestrial highway in Rachel, Nevada. Target has cleverly implemented rooftop billboards at its location near major airports such as Chicago's O'Hare, New York LaGuardia, and Boston Logan. In 2007, when Starbucks sponsored the annual corn maze at Denver Botanic Gardens, they received some aerial airplay as part of the deal. Fun stuff! SS Hasim Rek. On December 1, 2003, a Bolivian cargo ship called the SS Hasim ran aground off Sudan's Wingate coast and sank. The 265 foot long vessel, which can be seen laying on its side, is one of the world's largest shipwrecks visible on Google Earth. It sank visibly close to shore, and to this day, nobody knows why the ship capsized. The website EmperorDivers.com requested for the ship's remains to be relocated into deeper water. At the time, however, the Sudanese government was still trying to figure out who was to blame for the sinking. It's one of many shipwrecks off the Wingate coast. Another creepy wrecked vessel that's visible on Google Earth is the World Discoverer cruise ship, which struck an object while sailing down the Sandfly Passage in the Solomon Islands in April 2000 and began taking on water. To this day, the ship remains in Roderick Bay, where the captain grounded it. Luckily, everyone aboard survived the ordeal. The passenger ship SS Mahino was converted into a floating hospital during World War I and saw service transporting wounded soldiers between Melbourne and Sydney and in Europe. After the war, the vessel returned to New Zealand where a shipbreaker from Osaka, Japan purchased her. But a cyclone hit and the tow line between the SS Mahino and its tow ship severed. Attempts to refloat the ship were unsuccessful and to this day, its rusty remains are visible in satellite images captured from above. A pentagram. The pentagram, a five-pointed star that is heavily associated with Satanism and evil, was spotted in Google Earth images taken above Kazakhstan in recent years. It was seen in a remote corner of the landlocked former Soviet Republic on a piece of land protruding into a lake. The shape is etched into the ground in clearly defined straight lines and surrounded by a circle. The city of Lysakovsk is the nearest hint of civilization to the 1,200-foot rendering. Not surprisingly, given its history, many people jump to sinister conclusions regarding the pentagram and its alleged purposes. One obvious assumption is that the site has something to do with devil worship. It's far more likely, however, that the star represented the USSR and was created during the Soviet era, according to archaeologist Emma Uzmanova, who works nearby. It is the outline of a park made in the form of a star. This makes perfect sense since the star was a popular Soviet symbol. Locals who live near the former park enjoy poking fun about the Satanism conspiracies on their online reviews of the site. Ship Graveyard on the south shore of New York City's Staten Island Borough is a tugboat graveyard containing two dozen decrepit ships that once actively traveled in New York Harbor. Nestled between Staten Island and New Jersey, Whit Marina is accessible via an old cemetery and a rubbish-strewn path of soft mud that visitors are sure to sink into by a few inches as they trudge along. 
The New York Times reported in 1990 that there were some 200 ships at the site. According to kayakers, there are now less than 25 vessels, all of which are rotting, rusted out, or otherwise in disrepair. And you can see the entire mess from a bird's eye view, courtesy of Google Earth. A man named John J. Witt established the boatyard during the 1930s. He refused to dismantle the boats and was instead intent on selling them. As a result, Witt bit off more than he could chew and accumulated too many boats, with some dating as far back as World War I. The site, which is now known as Donjon Recycling, has become a habitat for marine life and will remain untouched due to environmental laws. A Star-Shaped Town The northeastern Italian town of Palmanova is what's known as a star fort. It's shaped like a nine-pointed star and has a perplexing yet impressive view from the sky. The paradoxically futuristic-looking locality was founded in 1593 as a representation of an ideal Renaissance city. The fortress city was designed to defend against attacks from the Ottomans in Bosnia, author Edward Muir told The Telegraph. Built according to humanist and military specifications, Palmanova was supposed to be inhabited by self-sustaining merchants, craftsmen, and farmers. In other words, Palmanova's concentric layout was designed and built according to utopian ideals of the time. To well-educated 16th-century Europeans, the concept of a perfectly geometrically shaped city was all the rage. The first circle alone, which measures four miles in circumference, took 30 years to build. Back in its heyday, a moat surrounded the town, along with three large guarded gates. At the center of the town is a perfectly hexagonal town square, or piazza. But according to Muir, nobody wanted to live there, despite its pristine conditions and elegant layout. To fill the vacant town, in 1622, Venice began pardoning criminals and offering them plots in Palmanova, along with building materials. Between 1816 and 1866, it was under Austrian rule. Then Palmanova was annexed to Italy. A century later, it became a national monument. Water Dragons A fisherman got a surprise when he landed a catch from the river Irtysh, which flows through Russia, China, and Kazakhstan. Fisherman Alexei claims that he had caught underwater dragons. Well, actually, they were pike. Pike are long, carnivorous fish with many sharp teeth. They are already pretty intimidating, but until now, none of them had horns. One fish weighed 12 kilograms and was sporting two horns, and the smaller one weighed 7 kilograms and had four. Everyone warned him not to eat the mutant fish in case they were poisoned, but he didn't seem to mind because he ended up eating them. However, he did keep and dry the heads, which can now be seen on display in his garage. So what caused the pike to look the way they did? While it's easy to think that the local folktales of underwater dragons have come true, others offer a more rational but disturbing explanation. There's been concern in the area about pollution from falling rocket parts from launches at Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, poisoning the water with fuel. Did this cause the fish to mutate? Journalists have been blaming the debris containing rocket fuel for illnesses in children in the area. There is also the Tarski Mining and Processing Combine near the area where the fish were taken from the river. Perhaps these factors are creating the dragon pikefish. Wolffish The Atlantic wolffish is also known as the sea wolf and the devilfish. Images of a mutant wolffish caught off the coast of Japan in 2015 went viral and people started to panic. Wolffish are an important part of the ecosystem since they control green crab and sea urchin populations. And not very many things can eat sea urchins. These tough fish can grow up to 4 feet. However, the average is about 1.6 to 3.2 feet long. That's still pretty big. Everyone was beginning to think that this monster fish was caused by the Fukushima disaster. Like something out of a comic book, perhaps the nuclear accident created mutant fish with special powers. However, very few mutations lead to an extra-large size. So is this real or not? Fisherman Hiroshi Hirasaka did catch this fish, but somehow he was able to hold it up to the camera in such a way as to make it look enormous. But it was still an impressive catch, and this fish was probably very old and healthy. Its ugly face and Hirasaka's expression are completely real. Indian Gunch In 1998, 17-year-old Dil Bahadur was swimming with his girlfriend and some friends in the Kali River in India when he was suddenly dragged underwater by some unknown force. He never resurfaced. A few months later, a young boy was pulled underwater and disappeared. In 2007, an 18-year-old was also dragged down, but this time witnesses saw what they described as a water pig. But what was this mysterious creature that was causing strong young men to disappear underwater? Biologist Jeremy Wade from River Monsters went to go find the truth behind the attacks. 
People said it was the Indian goonch. But what is it? Related to the catfish, the goonch is a freshwater predator that grows to quite an alarming size. They can grow as long as 1.8 meters, or 6 feet, and weigh up to 160 pounds. It's more than capable of hurting a human, and if the rumors are to be believed, it's already developed a taste for our species. Jeremy Wade was told by locals that the monster fish had developed a taste for human flesh. It was getting bigger as it ate human remains discarded from funeral pyres along the riverbanks. Wade discounted other kinds of animals, such as sharks and crocodiles, and set up a funeral pyre to lure one in. Soon after, they caught a record-breaking six-foot goonch, but it was not likely the man-eater responsible for the disappearances. But there were probably larger ones out there waiting in the murky water. Carp with two mouths. You can find all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff on Reddit, and this fish from 2017 is definitely more weird and kind of disturbing. Reddit user Stuffy Unicorn posted a video of a spooky fish with what appears to have two heads and two enormous gaping mouths. Everyone wanted to know what had caused this bizarre phenomenon. Maybe it had been affected by pollution, which had caused a weird mutation, or perhaps it was some type of conjoined twin. The general view is it's an Asian carp with a crazy deformity, but people are more mesmerized by its mouths opening and closing. It also looks like it has four eyes, but as for the extra eyes, well, don't look too close as you might get sneezed on. Their nostrils. Commentators think the mouth at the bottom isn't actually a mouth. It could have resulted from an injury that then opened up, or due to its gills not being attached correctly to the lower jaw. We'll never know the real story behind why this carp looks the way it does. The fish could still be swimming around now quite happily. The only trouble is that extra hole in its face is letting out food, so it might be on a diet whether it likes it or not. And now for number seven. But first, let me know about your strange catches. And be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Fish with human teeth. There are actually several types of fish with very human looking teeth. We have the paku fish and the sheep's head fish. The paku fish is closely related to the piranha and is native to South America, although they have been known to escape captivity and thrive in waterways throughout the world. They can grow up to 3.5 feet long and weigh up to 88 pounds. Their teeth, unlike piranhas that are sharp, are flat and look just like a human's. This is the closest any other species has to teeth like our own, and it seems they put them to good use. The paku fish's nickname is the nutcracker. And while they are very fond of eating nuts, legend says it's the other kind of nuts that they like. So guys, watch out! They supposedly have been known to mistake testicles for low-hanging nuts and have no problem taking a bite. This isn't funny because this can cause severe blood loss and can even be fatal. There are many local stories about these fish in the Amazon, but the myth is yet to be fully verified. The sheep's head fish also has very human-like teeth that look like they kind of need braces. They are a common species in North and South America, and they have multiple rows of molars behind their front teeth, which helps them grind up food as they chew. Much like with human children, the molars grow in as they get older. Unlike humans, on the other hand, the musculature of the jaw improves throughout their entire lives, and fish who live near an abundance of shelled prey will therefore have greater jaw-crushing power. Fishermen have observed specimens with jaws capable of breaking metal fish hooks in half. Two-Headed Dolphin In 2014, a very rare find washed up on the Aegean coast city of Izmir, Turkey. A gym teacher on vacation made the discovery of a very unusual two-headed dolphin. While we all know they aren't fish, it is only the fifth known case of conjoined twin dolphins, and only the third known to have lived beyond the fetal stage, according to a 2008 study in the Journal of Wildlife Diseases. Marine biologists from Actinus University will examine the carcass to find out more. It's hard to know how old they were or even what exact species of dolphin this was. In the case of conjoined wild mammals like this, the chances of survival are very low, and these poor creatures were lucky to make it out of the womb. It's very rare for wild mammals to be born this way, and many don't even survive birth. While conjoined twins in humans are relatively common, it is extremely rare in wild mammals. Biologists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration estimate that the rate of conjoined twins in marine mammals is less than 1%. These mutations can take several forms, and these twins would have had enormous difficulty swimming and coming to the surface to breathe. These dolphins had polycephaly, which is caused by the incomplete splitting of a fertilized egg. Polycephaly has been found in people, snakes, sheep, dogs, and fish. 
birdfish. This little fishy went viral after it landed on the deck of a fishing boat in China's Gizhou province. At first glance, it seems like a half-fish, half-bird mutant creature. It does have the appearance of a mermaid pigeon type thing, right? China's Gizhou urban newspaper broke the news in 2018 and shared a video of this strange fish gasping for air. People said that its mouth looked like a beak and its little fins looked like wings, and that perhaps it was some sort of new species. However, the real explanation is a bit different. Experts have identified it as a common freshwater carp that happens to have a deformed head. Its strange head was probably caused by a developmental problem early in life. This is not that unusual with things such as the pinhead deformity affecting marine life and making them look kind of alien. It's hard to say what caused the fish to be that way. It could be a genetic mutation or, somewhat worryingly, pollution. Environmental pollution, such as chemical contaminants that come into contact with fish larvae, can intercept an embryo's normal growth and trigger other effects. The main thing is, after gaping at the struggling birdfish for a while and filming it for the whole world to see, these astonished fishermen did the decent thing and popped it back in the water. Bye, little birdfish! Cyclops Shark Fishermen in Mexico made a truly bizarre catch in 2011. Plying their trade off the coast of Baja California Sur, they discovered a real cyclops shark. They had brought up a female dusky shark, and when they cut open the catch, they found this 22-inch long fetus with a single large eye at the front of its head. Pictures of it were the talk of the internet, and many believed this picture was fake. But this shark is real and suffers from a congenital condition called cyclopia. Biologists from the Interdisciplinary Center of Marine Sciences in La Paz, Mexico, asked permission from Enrique Lucero León, the fisherman, to x-ray and study the fetus. When they're born, babies are supposed to have two brain hemispheres and two optical lobes to see with as a result. The forebrain separates while still an embryo, but in this case, that didn't happen. Very few cyclops sharks have been documented, and they were also embryos, demonstrating that scientists still have a lot to learn and that these sharks don't survive long in the wild. Giant Fluorescent Blue Fish In 2018, a bizarre, brightly colored mutant fish was discovered in a lake in North Carolina. At least, that's if you believe what you see and read on YouTube. Measuring approximately 1.2 meters or 4 feet in length, it made a striking impression when footage of it was posted online. However, no one knows whether it's a fish or not. Located in Gaston County, someone filmed the strange creature asking if someone could identify the anomaly. The fact that it appears to be swimming along has convinced some people that it's real. For others, they just aren't having it, believing it to be anything from a dead bird to a remote-controlled robot. Its unique blue color made some guess it was a dead peacock getting pulled around. But if sharks with one eye exist, why couldn't a fluorescent blue fish in a lake exist? Some have said it might be an aquarium fish that was injected to make it look blue, while others said it might be a carp. What do you think it is? Let me know in the comments below! Pug-nosed striped bass Another creepy catch was this mutant fish caught in the Chesapeake Bay. Anglers were live-lining when they reeled in the pug-nosed striped bass. This fish is probably not mutant because of swimming too close to a chemical plant or getting rocket fuel dumped on it. This kind of mutation is considered to be a naturally occurring mutation because it has been seen kind of often. First reported in the 60s, they usually have trouble passing water over the gills and holding on to prey. But this particular fish showed no signs of being disadvantaged. Not only was it healthy looking, but it put up quite a fight before landing on deck. The sea is a mysterious place, and so we'll never find out why that fish's hooter is especially large. Not least because the fishermen ate the bass, pug nose and all. For me, it's not the type of thing I'd want to eat after that. Giant Chernobyl Catfish Now, if you're going to find a mutant fish anywhere in the world, Chernobyl is the place, right? Well, it might not be as simple as you think. It was the site of a terrible tragedy, the effects of which are felt to this day. But take a look inside the plant's cooling pond and you'll see what appears to be enormous catfish. Appearances can be deceptive, though. It isn't unusual for these catfish to get large. In fact, the largest on record was a Mekong catfish that was nearly 9 feet long and weighed 646 pounds. Italian fisherman Dino Ferrari caught a 280-pound catfish measuring 8.8 .8 feet. Wells catfish is one of the world's largest freshwater fish, too. It's not feasible, according to experts, that radiation would allow them to grow anyway. If anything, they would be pretty weak and puny, not strong and tough like these guys. The really surprising thing is that the Chernobyl pond is a good environment for the catfish. That's because they virtually have the place to themselves, and they eat pretty much everything, which makes things easier. 
If these are mutants, then they sure are happy ones. Barracuda Found throughout the Atlantic and parts of the Pacific, barracuda are some of the largest and most ferocious ocean predators. There are 28 known species, some of which can grow to up to 65 inches long, and all of which have a streamlined body and the characteristic fang-like teeth. They are opportunistic predators and can achieve short bursts of speed of up to 27 miles per hour to catch up with their prey. They hunt other fish and usually simply bite them in half before devouring the remains, and their shimmering silver bodies can be difficult to see in the open water until they are up close. There have been some reports of barracuda attacks on divers, and they're renowned as being vicious fish. They probably see humans as being large predators and follow them in the hope of being able to eat the remains of any prey, and will bite if you try to touch them. While they aren't as deadly as their reputation suggests, they still require caution if they are swimming close by. Ocean Sunfish The ocean sunfish, also known as the mola mola, is one of the heaviest bony fish in the world. They can weigh up to 2.5 tons, which is 5,000 pounds, and measure 11 feet long. Its flattened body is often as tall as it is long, and if it comes towards you head on, you might not even see it. But when it turns to the side, bam! That is one gigantic fish. In 2015, off the coast of Portugal, some divers were in for quite a shock when they had a rare encounter with a mola mola. Usually, they roam far away from established diving sites, but can be found in temperate and tropical oceans around the world. They have humongous dorsal fins and are often confused for sharks when they get near the surface of the water. They are unable to close their mouths completely and look pretty much like a fish head with large fins, almost like half a fish. The divers at first thought they had come upon a great white shark. That would get your heart racing. But they got the thrill of a lifetime when they realized it was a gentle giant. The giant sunfish that was found actually has a mouth big enough to swallow the divers whole, but it has no inclination to do so, mainly because it's a harmless fish that usually eats jellyfish for a living. These divers got to get up close and personal with the mola mola and got some incredible footage. Oceanic White Tip Shark of the approximately 440 different species of shark, there are some that are known for being particularly dangerous towards people. But it might surprise you to know that the shark you should watch out for the most might not be the great white, but instead the oceanic white tip shark. Famed underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau said that they were easily the ones to be most cautious of, and they are responsible for more human deaths than any other. The reason for this is that the stocky, slow-moving but highly aggressive sharks are scavengers and are present throughout the colder, deep ocean waters across the globe. The largest ever caught was 13 feet long and weighed 370 pounds. So if one ever decides to turn its focus on a diver, there is only one likely outcome. There have been numerous reports of them attacking shipwreck survivors and divers who get too close. And by working together, they can kill hundreds of people in one go. Big thank you to Gloria Lerma. I know that we've had some sound issues, so thank you so much for your patience and thanks for being such a nice sub, Gloria. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the Origins Explained family. Giant Pyrosome The giant pyrosome is a free-floating, bizarre biological entity. It's made up of thousands of cloned organisms called zooids and make practically no sense. They are cone or cylinder-shaped colonies that float around in the upper layers of warm seas and can be up to 60 feet long. Each zooid is surrounded by a gelatinous substance that joins everybody. Not many have seen them in real life, and they are even known as the unicorns of the sea. Why? Because they are so strange, giant but delicate and fragile, and very rare. But off the coast of Tanzania in 2013, divers got a great opportunity. One diver touched the pyrosome and described it like an exquisitely soft feather boa, and they got pictures and video to prove it. Despite being comprised of many organisms, as the diver saw and others have noted, it doesn't really move freely on its own like you would expect. It mostly gets pulled around by the tides and currents, much like a jellyfish. They do have a small ability to use jet propulsion and can move very slowly. The one that the diver saw of Tanzania was looking around for water that is rich in plankton, which are the zooid's favorite food. Giant pyrosomes are also known as one of the few creatures that have natural bioluminescence, meaning that they can glow in the water, usually giving off a rich blue color. Scorpion fish The name scorpion fish is an umbrella term used to refer to hundreds of fish species, each of which have extremely powerful venom that can be very dangerous to divers who encounter them. Most commonly found in the Indo-Pacific, the most famous is the lionfish that, because of their appearance, have become popular in aquariums around the world. You might even have one at home. 
but these fish are now an invasive species, and many have been released into local water systems, not only surviving, but eating everything in sight and taking over warmer waters. Most types of scorpion fish are bottom feeders and wait for prey to pass by before leaping into action. Most have spines across their dorsal and pelvic fins, and it's on these that their venom glands are located. A sting from a lionfish, for example, can lead to nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headaches, heart failure, paralysis, and even death, which is why any diver visiting a reef where they're present is warned to stay well clear. The Sea Wasp Chironex flicari, more commonly known as the sea wasp, is generally regarded as the most venomous species of jellyfish in the world. With tentacles of up to 10 feet long, they are covered in millions of cnidocytes, which inject microscopic venomous darts into anything they touch. A sting from one of these on a human can lead to death within five minutes, and each jelly contains enough venom to kill 60 people. They are thought to be responsible for 63 deaths in Australia alone in the century up to 1996, but the total number across the Indo-Pacific where they live is likely to be far higher than this. It's just hard to say because many deaths are attributed to other things rather than a jellyfish sting. While their bells grow to the size of a basketball, this species is virtually transparent when it's in the water, which makes them a particular danger to swimmers and divers. Locals have, however, developed an ingenious way to avoid being stung by one. Because the tiny darts are short and mean that the tentacles need to make direct contact with your skin, if you wear stockings over your arms and legs while in the water, they are unable to sting you. Finally, a simple solution. Stingray Stingrays are some of the most majestic creatures in the ocean and seemingly fly through the water. They are known for being extremely gentle and are popular for people to swim with, but they can pose a real threat if you're not careful. There are more than 220 different known species covering a wide range of different shapes and sizes, but the common thing you have to be wary of is their stinger. Sometimes as long as the rest of the body, the appendage is covered in barbs which break off very easily when being used. It will only sting if it feels threatened, and in most cases it will puncture the skin, release a barb inside, and inject venom. It's the physical puncture that causes the most pain, but victims can also suffer from swelling, muscle cramps, and an infection. Surgery might be needed to remove the parts of the stinger that are left in the body, but usually someone who's been stung by a ray will make a full recovery. If, however, they happen to sting you in a vulnerable place, the damage can be far more severe. As you may remember, Australian naturalist Steve Irwin sadly died for this reason, but his was only the second known stingray-related death in Australian water since 1945. Flower Urchins If you've ever been swimming near a reef, chances are that you've seen an urchin nestled within the coral. There are more than 200 different species of them in all shapes and sizes, but the most dangerous of all are flower urchins. They are found in the waters of the Indo-Pacific, like most of these creatures, and live at depths of up to 295 feet. They can grow to a size of up to 8 inches in diameter and have a flower-like structure that's usually pink or yellow in color with a central purple dot in each segment. Flower urchins are regarded as being extremely dangerous thanks to the presence of three toxins that they contain. They interfere with the signals being passed through nerves, can affect how well the blood coagulates, lower body temperatures, and can induce a sleepy sensation. Large doses can be administered simply by brushing past one and can lead to an anaphylactic-like reaction and death. There are, however, no known cases of fatalities that have been directly attributed to this species, but you should still be extremely wary if you see one. Don't touch it. Stonefish Stonefish are another venomous species of fish that live in tropical Indo-Pacific waters and are even more dangerous because of their ability to camouflage into the seabed. They can be found in shallow waters throughout the region and are bottom dwellers that wait for their prey to pass by before they strike. Growing to up to 13 inches long, they are covered in wart-like lumps, have big heads and mouths, but tiny eyes that stick above the sediment where they hide. The top of their bodies are covered in spines, and it's the grooves within these that contain their venom. Divers are warned about walking on the seabed because of the risk of disturbing these fish, as it's very easy to stand on one without realizing that it's there. It'll inject venom through the spines in proportion to how hard you step on it, and a sting can be extremely painful. It can also be fatal, but luckily there is an effective anti-venom that, if administered in time, is effective to combat the effects. It's actually the second most commonly administered anti-venom treatment in Australia because stings are so frequent. And it's a testament to its wide availability that there have been no deaths attributed to stonefish for a long time. Cone Snail 
On the surface, they may not look too dangerous, but the more than 500 different species of cone snails are often said in the diving community to be one of the deadliest animals in the ocean. Their shells are normally covered in brown, black, or white patterns, and you can see the appeal of them for collectors. But you must never hold one of these in your hand because they have a powerful sting. Often you may not even know if one is near because they hide themselves beneath the top layer of the seabed, waiting for something to disturb them so they can attack. Their noses are always sensing what's around, and when the time is right, they deploy a needle-sharp proboscis from the mouth like a mini harpoon. The attack is quick and injects venom that has pain-killing qualities to it, so it's quite possible that you could be stung without even realizing it. That's where the danger comes from because it means victims won't seek medical treatment and by the time they realize what's happened, it's too late. Just a few microliters of their venom is enough to kill 10 people, but it's only thought that around 30 people have fallen victim to the sting in the past few decades. Still, if you see one, it's best not to pick it up, even if you're wearing gloves because their proboscis can easily penetrate rubber or fabric. Blue Ringed Octopus these beautiful creatures are blue-ringed octopuses, but as with most things in the animal kingdom, their vivid colors warn of a deadly surprise. They are found in the warmer waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, surprise, surprise, and can be easily recognized by their blue and black rings that will change color when they feel in danger. They feed on crabs and other crustaceans, but at only 8 inches in size, they can be difficult to see in the water. They won't attack divers on a reef, but because of the way they look, people have fallen victim to them by picking them up. They are generally regarded as one of the most venomous marine creatures in the world and have large concentrations of tetrodotoxin. Each octopus has enough venom to kill 26 people within a matter of minutes, and they're especially dangerous because quite often you won't realize you've been bitten until the symptoms begin to appear. At first, victims find it difficult to breathe, then they will struggle to move until they are fully paralyzed and then death follows shortly after. There is no anti-venom for a blue-ringed octopus bite, but if artificial respiration can be provided, then victims are likely to recover. Do you want to risk it? I don't think so. Sea snakes If you see a snake in the water, you'll want to treat it just like you do on land. Stay as far away as possible. Divers often encounter them while swimming around reefs, and they must be treated with a great deal of caution. They tend to have more flattened bodies and tails than land snakes, and this means that they are very good swimmers, which combined with their inquisitive nature means that they can approach you far quicker than you expect. They are usually found throughout the warmer waters of the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans, and it's thought that most species evolved from land snakes in Australia. They rely on breathing air and have enlarged lungs to allow them to swim underwater so are only ever found in shallow coastal regions. As they're related to land crates and cobras, most sea snakes are venomous, but the toxins in their bites are usually far more powerful. The neurotoxins and mycotoxins can easily paralyze a person, and this will almost inevitably lead to drowning unless the victim is very close to shore. The most venomous of all is possibly the beaked sea snake, and just three drops of its venom can kill a person. However, it is very hard to measure just how venomous a sea snake actually is, since they don't necessarily release all of their venom in one bite. Luckily, it, and most sea snakes, have small fangs, so will struggle to puncture a wetsuit. Just be careful where you stick your hand when exploring the reefs. Thanks for watching! Have you ever been diving, or have you ever encountered a venomous sea creature? Let me know in the comments below! Remember to subscribe, and I'll see you next time! Bye!